Right, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to our event on veganism and multi-species justice uh, within our research networks theme four on queer ecological justice. And we're very happy to welcome our guest speakers today, Christopher Sebastian, Corey Wren, and Emilia Quinn. Um, on this event webpage, you can see uh, that we began with a quote from Kim Tolbert uh, that says, whose relatives, including other than humans, will thrive and whose will be laid to waste? And this quote reflects our concern about social justice as a remedy to the reproduction of inequalities. It applies to those lives, human and non-human, that are laid to waste through events such as, as I must say today, the war waged this morning on Ukraine by the president of Russia. The suffering caused by this war is devastating. It paradoxically speaks to the theme of queerness and conflict that we discussed in our meeting last time. But this quote also refers to other than humans. And with this in mind, we have convened today's event. Today, three prominent academics and activists working on veganism will discuss intersections of their scholarship and activism with broader work on social justice, including racial, gender, and LGBTQ perspectives. It will also involve a conversation between activism, sociology, and literary studies. We maintained our usual term we use for events of this kind, creative method event, as we and we also called it scholar activist roundtable, because this event involves conversations across disciplines and also across academia and activism, which are all at the core of our research work. So uh, today, Christopher, Corey, and Emilia will speak about their work for some 20 minutes each. Uh, this part will be recorded, and then we'll move on to the Q&A and discussion during the second hour of our meeting. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Christopher Sebastian, uh, who is a writer, journalist, and digital media researcher. He's the director of social media for Peace Advocacy Network. He sits on the advisory council for Encompass. He's a senior fellow at Sentient Media, and he has lectured at Columbia University in the Department of Social Work for the graduate course Pop, Power, Oppression, and Privilege. Using a multidisciplinary approach that includes media theory, political science, sociology, and mass communications, he focuses on how human relationships with other animals shape our attitudes about racial, sexual, and political identity. So over to you, Christopher, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much for that amazing, awesome introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I could not say how much I appreciate being like with this group of people because I've been following Amelia's work and Corey's work for a very, very long time, and they're both such incredible women. Um, without them and the scholarship that others like them have provided, I wouldn't be here. So, like, I'm immensely grateful to them, and I am really grateful to you for this opportunity. So much so that I am going to like try to speak as quickly as possible and keep my presentation to about 15 minutes so that we can get to the discussion because I think um, in my like you know experience that's where the real magic happens when people are able to talk to one another um, and communicate rather than me just regurgitating things onto a screen. So I'm going to share my desktop right now. I'm speaking to you from my phone. And I am going to present the slideshow. There we go. All right, so my presentation, Gay Panic at the Commie Vegan Disco. Um, this is actually part of the work that I had done for my thesis, um, which actually examined um, like animal symbolism in US political discourse and um, what animals um, are encoded with, what messages animals are encoded with in a mass communication sense from our political leaders. Um, and like, you know, and uh, what messages are being decoded by the public and like how these messages are circulated and reproduced among people. Um, and like, this is just one portion of it. I examined different communities of people and like, you know, and really, really got to know some um, groups of people and how they respond to um, animal exploitation, um, animal violence in a variety of ways. 
um, and in many ways how we perpetuate collectively animal violence. And, um, and it was a, an incredibly eye-opening experience. This was an ongoing experience too. Um, like this work is incomplete. Um, but like in this particular portion, I definitely want to let people know that like, you know, content warning for like strong language around sexual violence and sexual themes. Um, and so let's just jump right on into it. Um, there were two really major points that I wanted to cover um, because like this was an entire chapter that sprawled all over the place. Um, because like when you start to examine the intersections between queerness and queer liberation and um, animal liberation, like one thread leads to another and another and another. And then you have this like really rich tapestry um, so like I pulled out two of the main points for this particular presentation that I thought were really interesting and relevant to the discussion today. Um, this one is a quote that was in the Washington Post along with like several other like major um, publications in the USA from 2019. And um, if you read the quote, it is from a trapping advocate. His name is Nick Katrina and it is something else like he actually says animal rights activists are terrorist groups mostly led by lesbians who destroy property and burn down animal research facilities for their cause and progressives in their march toward communism are trying to ban trapping they'll get rid of hunting too after they take over the government of the united states um this is a lot I don't know where to begin. If you have things to contribute or if you like have comments, I always encourage people to participate in the chat as much or as little as they want to. It doesn't distract me so much as it gives me an indication that you're there, that you're paying attention, that you like something, that you hate something or flagging something that um, that you came across that may be like, you know, a bit much for you, whatever have you. Um, this quote, however, was a, a bit much for me. This was absolutely incredible. My first thought when I read it was, oh, well, that's going in um, because it's, it's huge. There's so much being said here, so much being encoded here um, that like, you know, that, that people don't even realize. We oftentimes give ourselves away in communication um, in ways that we don't mean to, what they say about like, saying the quiet part out loud. Um, let's just take this particular quote apart piece by piece um, because there's so much to be said about it. Animal rights activists are terrorist groups mostly led by lesbians. Um, if you have followed the work of Carol Adams, then of course you're familiar with the sexual politics of meat. Um, actually like, you know, leading, like actually saying that like animal rights groups um, are a terrorist groups, like let's begin there. They're actually terrorists. Um, and saying that they're led by lesbians is an indication that like, you know, that there is a fear of women in leadership and female leadership. Um, and like, we've already got comments. This one is from Mary saying a manifestation of white hetero male human capitalist supremacy. A plus to Mary. Like there's like, you know, like what more needs to be said about that? Like that's so huge. Um, and like, you know, and that's where like, like that's his opening gambit here. This is where he starts. Um, who destroy property and burn down animal research facilities for their cause. And progressives, like so, like we're we're like already marrying lesbians and terrorism. We're actually adding progressives to the mix in their march toward communism. This is actually a really important part because you're encoding animal rights and animal liberation with queerness, um, with terrorism, and with progressivism. So you're not actually making a secret about your political allegiances or your political alliances. You're actually making that quite clear and foregrounding like, you know, where you lie on the political spectrum, perhaps unintentionally without even realizing it. Um, and like, you know, and the fact that like you're hanging all of this on the back of communism um, is just another way to vilify or to like, you know, or to encode like, you know, anti quote, American values um, and like, you know, um, into like your messaging um, and like, and also specifically encoding um, American, um, uh, like American exceptionalism, which is a really huge part of like, I've discovered like animal symbolism in the United States and the discourse around it in our political circles. Um, and yeah, like, you know, they're trying to ban trapping um, because of course, like trapping being tied to the fur industry, as you can see here from this image, they'll get rid of hunting too after they take over the government of the United States. Spoiler alert. Absolutely, absolutely. This is definitely right on the front page of the website. It's all a part of the manifesto. Not trying to hide it. Definitely want hunting to go away. I am absolutely, I don't know how you got into the meeting, but this is definitely a thing that's gonna happen. 
you heard it here first, folks. Nick Katrina definitely like put it all out there right in the open. Um, and like, you know, and it's really interesting because in some ways he's actually onto something. He's actually onto something. More and more people are identifying as anything but straight. Um, like there was a 2016 YouGov survey that was actually done in the UK that said that up to a third of people between the ages of 16 and 24 um, like identify as like not heterosexual. That's absolutely huge. You know what else is really true about young people? There is a march toward quote socialism and communism um, like among much younger people. Why? Because the capitalist establishment has failed people under the age of what well, actually it's failed everybody that's you know like, that's my opinion, but it's failed people. Um, like in the past 20 years, we've had two, not one, two once in a lifetime, um, like economic crashes that have like, you know, that have completely burned young people out. So like, you know, what he's saying, although it is extraordinary, is not completely out of left field. People are adopting more, quote, um, socialist beliefs. And, um, and this is like again as like you know as was said in the comments a manifestation of fears that are being experienced fears and anxieties that are being experienced by people who hold very firmly to like you know mostly white male and heterosexual beliefs um and political ideologies so like this was like you know for me like this was such a a huge thing and like most importantly there is a not insignificant number of queer people who actually either adhere to a plant-based diet or would otherwise call themselves specifically vegan. Um, like, you know, there is a quite high representation um, among, like, you know, among queer people. Also, as had been reported by the Washington Post, not incidentally, um, in a article that was dated January of 2020, um, like one of the largest populations of people that is adopting a plant-based diet in the United States are Black. So people who are experiencing or who have experienced minoritization or marginalization within the US political system are actually looking more and more into plant-based diets. And that feeds a lot into the fears and anxieties of these people as well. That was point number one. Number two, I wanted to talk about how frequently people um, who are political leaders actually dog whistle to people. And I don't know how exactly, um, how species is that fake phrase is to use like, you know, a quote dog whistle. Um, that like same sex attraction or like same sex relationships, intimate relationships between consenting adults um, should be comparable or comparative to bestiality. On this slide, you're actually looking at um, representative, Republican representative from Texas, Louis Gohmert, who said, when you say it's not a man and a woman anymore, then why not have three men and one woman um, or four women and one man, which by the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because you can have as many men and women in an adult consensual relationship as you want to. There's no limit on this. Contrary to popular belief, like multi, like, you know, like multi-person relationships do exist. Um, monogamous relationships and monogamy is not the only sole option. Um, and then he goes on to say, or why not, you know, this is where it gets really fun somebody has a love for an animal or, and then he trails off. There's no clear place to draw a line once you eliminate the traditional marriage. And that trailing off is actually really important because people don't want to say the quiet part out loud because you generally know in political discourse that you're going to experience some backlash for making that comparison, but you've given people just enough information in order for them to draw their own conclusions. You go from people having adult consensual relationships straight down the quote slippery slope to like someone quote having a love for an animal. Um, and like, you know, and you make that comparison between bestiality and same sex attraction or same sex um, relationships. Um, and he's not the only one. I could actually like just like give you examples of this, um, particularly, um, particularly like Republican, um, like Republican leaders, Republican politicians, but it is across the political spectrum. Um, but we won't just like go over all of these quotes like all day long um, because there are just so many of them. This is um, representative from Pennsylvania, Rick Santorum, who says in every society, the definition of marriage has not ever, to my knowledge, included homosexuality <laughs> in every society, he says. That's not to pick on homosexuality. Really, Rick? Really? Is that true? Like it's not to pick on homosexuality? Um, it's not, you know, man on child, man on dog or whatever the case may be, it's one thing. 
So again, you have Republican politicians, um, like politicians in general, who like, you know, who, who create these juxtapositions between like, you know, same sex attraction to having sex with animals or more specifically, not even having sex with animals. Let's be realistic about what we're talking about because persons of other species cannot consent. We're talking about the sexual violation of other animals. Um, and like, and it's not lost on me that like we so frequently use dogs in these examples too. And I'll get back to that a little bit later on. What people actually don't take into consideration or what people don't actually say, um, like is three points that like, you know, that I have drawn from like all of these examples. Number one, people um, in the United States and in many other countries already sexually violate other animals. That's something that already happens. It's a fact of life. Point number two, most of the people who are sexually violating animals don't identify as queer. They identify as straight people. And number three, straight people actually don't care about other people sexually violating animals as long, as long as you don't sexually enjoy it. Um, let's take a look at the comments as a matter of fact. Um, the institution of marriage is a patriarchal property oriented, oriented construct. Once again, Marv, is like you know is is bringing bringing the tea here and Anne Sheridan says that they were so concerned they'd speak out against artificial insemination. Oh ho ho! Have I got news for you? That's coming right on up. So remembering these three points: number one, people already sexually violate animals. Number two, most of the people who do that are actually heterosexual or otherwise identify as heterosexual. Number three, people don't actually care as long as they don't think that you actually get sexual gratification from that. Um, as we're talking about these three points, I just want to say when people think about like sexual violations of animals, this is what they're thinking of. This slide is actually from a presentation that was done by Berlin based sociologist Jeff Manns, who is a really, really great friend of mine and he had done this presentation for me. It's available on my Patreon if you follow me. Um, if you don't follow me, it's actually still available because my Patreon is completely free. Um, it's, it's wide open for anybody to access all of the information that's there. And this presentation is, um, is saved to Vimeo that you can, you can find the link on there. Um, and Jeff was like, you know, he actually had done this talk about pet play, um, a fetish that has an emerging presence. While it's not always sexual, pet play can also be a form of kink play where humans dress up as non-human animals and their handlers enjoy in some sort, some form of sexual role play. That's one thing that people usually think of. It generally involves gay men. Um, this leads with the images that like that people conjure up in their minds when they're thinking about sexual violations of other animals. The other thing that people think about are these guys. These are what are called furries, people who like dress up in very, very expensive suits. I'm actually photographed here. I spent a tremendous amount of time with people who are part of the furry community. Again, um, dominated a community that's dominated by gay men. Um, and like, and here is the most interesting thing about furries. Although people think of it as a sexually perverse act to actually dress up in these costumes, there is precious little um, to zero sex that is actually going on. These suits can cost upwards of ten thousand um, dollars U.S. and like, and they're not interested in messing them up with like sweat or other bodily fluids by like entertaining sexual intercourse in them. Um, people actually adopting what's called a fursona is something that they do as part of fantasy play that is oftentimes not very sexual at all or has nothing to do with sex and like you know otherwise exists as a form of sexual fantasy that like you know that, that people would not ever want to realize in real life and in the like probably around 250 at this point um people that i've interviewed or talked to who are part of the furry community literally none i'm not talking about a number that is negligible negligible negligibly close to zero zero of them have confided in me that they actually want to have sex with other animals adopting a persona is something that is part of like you know being able to psychologically disassociate from the world around them and experience something that is pure, pure fantasy. Yet these are the images that people have in their mind when they're thinking about like adult sexual relationships with other animals, when the reality is very, very far from the truth. Um, again, straight people are the ones who primarily are like engaging in this type of sexual activity and with very specific animals. Do you want to know what animals are actually most at risk for like sexual violation? Because I did. And I wanted to find this out. This is actually an article from The Guardian from 2017, bestiality, which animals are most at risk? Really important 
Number one point, no reliable statistics exist on how many people engage in bestiality, but recent examples from academia and the news give us some clues. So there's a top four animals that are at risk for bestiality. Let's go over the list. Um, if anybody wants to guess, I'm gonna give you like five seconds to like just like plunge into the chat and just write what you think the top animals are. And just shout out anything. Like, you know, it could be something super mundane. It could be, we've got from Amelia, sheep, goats, cows, dogs, um, anybody else? Going once, going twice, counting down. Got a lot of horses in here, hens, camels. Depends on how it's defined. And actually brings up a really, really important point. Oh boy, um, I wish that I had more time to cover it in this conversation. Um, Marcin says sheep and cows. So like, yeah, very popular ones. Let's go down the line, the top four animals. Number one, horses in a 2000, Clara, actually really important point, like wolves actually manifest very, very strongly in the furry community um, with like, you know, anthropomorphic or for animals or personas, not so much in, um, in, in actual sexual activity, not so much. I think because it's really, really difficult to get near a wolf in real life, unless you have domesticated one yourself, um, because you'll end up with a world of hurt if you um, try to approach a horse to sexually, or excuse me, a wolf to sexually violate them. Number one, horses. In a 2009 study in the archives of sexual behavior about zoophilia um, and abnormal fondness of animals, a 47-year-old man, uh, married father of two, describes his sexual interest in horses. He said, when I was first married, I tried so hard to be um, to be good and didn't have any sexual contact with equines for about a year. After that, I couldn't suppress it anymore. And my contact with the horses rose while my, um, while my relationship with my wife declined. Tried to be a normal husband, but human sex always felt wrong. I could do it, but I couldn't learn to like it. Even closing my eyes and pretending she was a horse didn't work after a while. Um, you might be tempted to snigger at this or to like laugh, or to laugh, but this is the reality for a surprising, surprising number of people out there. Once again, this is a man who is married who felt compelled to actually in, enter into a marriage with another person. Um, oh boy, oh boy, Dr. Corey, I'm sure content analysis of pornography would throw up all sorts of horrific shit that academia may not have registered. And you're right. And you're right. When I was doing my own independent research um, outside of doing the literature review of like of articles that exist about this, I had reached out to Pornhub to find out like, you know, what their numbers were about people who were doing searches for this and what the most popular animals were by country. We won't get into that now, but holy smokes, like pornography gives us a tremendous amount of insight into this. Um, so yeah, this is a person who felt compelled to enter into um, a like a married relationship with a woman with a woman, like, you know, a supposedly like otherwise heterosexual man. Um, and this is really like, you know, this is devastating. This is like, you know, this is, this is sad and this is heartbreaking and in many ways traumatic for the people that are involved. I don't know if this person's wife ever found out about this or like, you know, or, or, or if like he ever confessed or confided in her that this was the reality that he's living with. But yeah, like this happens. Animal number two, snakes. In, a 26, in 2016, a London doctor was found guilty of possessing footage of bestiality, including a video of a man having sex with a snake. Brings up that question, how? It depends on how you are defining sex, um, which can be defined a variety of ways because intercourse does not always have to be, um, like it doesn't always have to be penetrative. So like, I will leave it to your own imaginations what sex with a snake looks like. Um, I imagine incredibly dangerous but like snakes are a surprisingly popular animal that people like otherwise copulate with. Um, dogs, in 2017, a 64 year old was charged by police after footage was found of her having sex with a St. Bernard, a black Labrador and an Alsatian. Uh, that also pleaded guilty to criminal charges in 2014 after footage was discovered of him having sex with a dog and a horse. Again, dogs and horses, dogs being so popular I think in part after like, you know, having conducted like interviews with people about this, um, like one of the things that makes dogs such a popular animal is that dogs are already, dogs are already domesticated animals and, um, and they live in our houses. And um, this is, this is hard um, sometimes, you know, I try to make light of it because like, you know, it's, it's a little bit funny, but like dogs are susceptible to this type of violence because they're so vulnerable because like they're never, no animals are actually in a position to be able to tell on someone 
no animals are ever in a position to be able to like, you know, to talk about um, their, their experiences of molestation or sexual violence against them. Um, and like, you know, and so we have like, you know, these animals who like are, are incredibly tormented at times by people who are living in their, like in their homes with them. Um, and like, you know, and they're, they're easy to access. They're easy to um, end up having sex with. Um, like, you know, or, or like, or to sexually violate. Um, I try to be very conscious about like actually saying having sex with animals um, or bestiality and just to be very direct about what we're calling it, which is a sexual violation. Um, and the last is cows. New York police arrested a man in 2014 for allegedly attempting to have sex with a cow while another man filmed it. Um, and like, according to a 2002 survey um, of 93 zoophiles, um, people who engage in this type of behavior again um, by Dr. Hani Maletsky. Um, like dogs and cows are probably the most frequent victims. Um, like, you know, so, so according to this research, um, you can look up Dr. Maletsky's book um, yourselves. Um, I would definitely encourage you to, but it is uh, $200 on Amazon and it's over $2,000 retail. So only if you've got like bags of money and you're not spending it on agave nectar or something um, or whatever it is that like vegans are eating these days. What do people accuse vegans of eating quinoa? You're damaging the environment and killing like, you know, or, or almonds, your bags of money to like, you know, to use to buy almonds, use it to buy the book. Um, yeah, so like, you know, dogs and, and cows are the most vulnerable animals. Um, and like, you know, and again, with good reason, cows are like in like such, how do you describe it, great supply. Um, but here, here again, like there's, oh boy, we've got more comments here. Roger, who is saying, it's claimed that horses and cows are preferred in bees U.S. Um, animal brothels when clients take, um, take their own buckets to stand on here again i don't know if this is like uh, if this is roger yates um but but yeah like this is like you know that is absolutely true this is absolutely true ryan says linked to the dogs animals that are traditionally domesticated are also very often used as instruments of emotional coercion in domestic marital relationship domestic abuse marital relationships i actually had done a presentation with sherry ramsey um for uh for um, a school of law in New York, and she's from HSUS, um, Indian Society of the United States. She actually has done a tremendous amount of work in this field. Um, the like, you know, like understanding domestic violence um, and domestic abuse, and um, and the use of animals as instruments of emotional coercion, and it is absolutely sickening. So thank you so much for that comment. And again, from Roger, there must be a class that's just descript dimension here. Um, like WC people have asked. People have access, ah, yeah, people have access to dogs, but horses, there is a huge class dimension. Um, if you, you probably don't have access to horses if you are a person of color who's living in the inner city. Um, like, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about that. And they're like, yeah, like, you know, but again, like going country by country, like these class dimensions or class analyses can change. Um, because like I limited my research to the United States is ab absolutely true. Um, Marv, Marv says, um, I thought it was Mary earlier. I apologize for that, Marv. Um, bestiality is principally a male abuse of non-human animals. And again, that is a correct statement in all of the research that I have seen. It has been indicated that like the primary um, aggressors of these sexual acts or the, these acts of sexual misconduct are male. Um, and, um, you know, very few of them are female. Another widespread dimension of sexual abuse of animals happens during the use of reproductive technologies in order to reproduce farm animals, something you discussed at length in your previous talks, and you're absolutely right. This is from um, Marcin, and that's really important. Um, that has to be brought up here, um, and that's why I actually saved this slide um, for, for one of the last ones that I'm going to put up. This is from the Metro in the UK. Um, it's an article from 2018 and it says, pensioner age 80 pushed his entire arm into a cow's rectum and masturbated. And then I have a quote from the article here um, that I thought was incredibly, incredibly relevant specifically to Marson's point. John Curno, age 80, was found guilty of two counts of outraging public decency after he molested several cows on at least two occasions. Now Marson, since you already um, brought that up, like you probably are already familiar with this example because I have used this one in particular before in other presentations. Um, oh boy, oh boy, Dr. Corey, um, like if we have like extra time, I definitely wanna talk about crush videos because that is one of the areas that like I am most sensitive to and enters into a whole other realm of like um, of discussion. Um, I'm gonna finish this up 
Like, I thought that this particular quote was interesting because he was found guilty of two counts of outraging public decency after he, and the journalist was very specific with their word choice here, molested several cows on at least two occasions. The use of the word molestation is relevant because we know and we can recognize that these acts are acts of sexual violence against animals, and we can recognize the victimhood of certain animals when we want to when we choose to. And this goes back to point number three earlier when I told you that there were three points that I wanted to make. People don't actually care about sexual violence toward other animals um, if they don't think that you are enjoying it. Because what do we know about animals? Bestiality actually occurs all the time. When? In, points, in times of animal reproduction. Um, if someone pushed their entire cat arm into a cow's rectum and did not masturbate themselves, that would be an acceptable thing. Why? Because we do that all the time on every dairy farm across all of the United States. And indeed, like, you know, in most countries as well, um, we are constantly pushing our arms into animal rectums, but we're not actually deriving to anyone's knowledge, sexual gratification from it. Um, but if there is sexual gratification, then it's all of a sudden a problem because this man, John Curnow, quote, masturbated. Um, and that, that is the act that somehow made it wrong. We don't actually care about animals or sexual violence toward animals. What we care about is like, is, is actually sex. What we care about is like a puritanical culture in which sex is wrong. Sexual gratification in every instance is wrong. Um, like, or excuse me, in every instance with the exception of heterosexual reproduction. And I said again at the beginning of this presentation that like I've been influenced by the work of other people, particularly women who are here today and like, you know, and, and people who are here today and like, you know, Amelia's work um, has been so influential to me. Um, and like, you know, to, to actually like, you know, to, and that needs to be recognized. Um, like heterosexual reproduction is something that like Amelia, I hope we'll get into in their, um, in their presentation on the monstrous vegan, but also like, you know, the work of Patrice Jones had influenced me as well, talking about compulsory heterosexuality um, and like, you know, and how like animals are subject to compulsory heterosexuality because of our use of them and our exploitation of them in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of like making more of them for us to exploit. Um, that's the end, I think. That was the last slide. Yeah, that was the last actual slide of the presentation. But like, I just wanted to like address that last thing that Corey had said, um, because it is so important. Um, and I'm just going to repeat that comment. We haven't discussed crush films either in which women's forced violence against other animals is sexualized for the male viewer. Control over women and animals is simultaneously um, is sexualized. And that is so true. Um, because again, in my own independent research, I have looked at a tremendous number of crush films. Um, and like, you know, like potophilia or like, you know, or, or sexual attraction to like non-sexual body parts like feet um, is quite common. And again, it's overwhelmingly male, um, gay men and straight men alike. And so like, you know, having looked into potophilia, um, like it is like, you know, it's, 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 it's surprisingly prevalent, but also I am overwhelmingly stunned at the prevalence of, um, of crush videos. And, um, and what Corey says um, about it being violence against animals and violence against women, um, it's, it's not just violence against, like, you know, like it's, it's, I don't know how to describe this because I didn't plan on talking about it in my presentation, but like, you know, but because Corey brought it up, I think that it's really relevant. Um, like it, it is such exploitation of um, women and, and sometimes children because like oftentimes the videos that I've seen appear to have persons in them that are minors, um, male and female. Um, and it's exploitative because overwhelmingly when I have seen these videos and having watched so many of them, um, the people that are involved, the people that do it, um, often are not doing it because they have, they, they get a sexual gratification of it themselves. They are people that are oftentimes in non-Western countries um, that are doing it for survival. Um, and I know that there are probably different opinions about like, you know, um, sexuality and, and, or excuse me, um, about sex works and, and prostitution. And like, we can have that conversation in a completely different thread, but this is coercive in a way that is almost indescribable. Um, because this is not like this is survival sex work for those people. 
They're not doing it because they like it. They're doing it because someone on the internet likes it and will pay um, what is probably a small sum of money for them, but a great deal of money to the person who is receiving it. Um, and they will film these videos for, for that sexual gratification. And it is, it's one of the things that shocked me the most when I started doing this. I am going to wrap up here. Um, I don't want to go over time. I tried to keep mine to 15 minutes so that like we could get into the discussion quicker. Um, and I, um, I am ready to like, you know, turn off my camera and listen to other people. Thank you again so much for letting me speak. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you so much for for uh, this talk and making us think. And um, I hope we can move on to uh, discussing uh, those themes as well as, as they speak to the, to, to the other themes uh, from the other talks in, in, in the second part. Uh, for now, I will directly, let me directly introduce uh, Corey Wren, our second speaker, uh, who's a lecturer of sociology um, in the School of Social Policy, Sociology and Social Research at the University of Kent. And she's also co-director of the Center for the Study of Social and Political Movements. Uh, Cory served as a council member with the American Sociological Association's Animal and, Animals and Society section. She was elected chair in 2018 and is co-founder of the International Association of Vegan Sociologists. She serves as book review editor to Society and Animals and is a member of the Vegan Society's Research Advisory Committee. In July 2013, uh, she founded the Vegan Feminist Network, an academic, an academic activist project engaging intersectional social justice praxis. praxis. She is the author of A Rational Approach to Animal Rights Extensions in Abolitionist Theory, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2016. Peacemeal Protest, Animal Rights in the Age of Nonprofits, published by University of Michigan Press 2019, and recently in 2021, Animals in Irish Society. Uh, That's the new book. Uh, Corey, um, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for that amazing introduction. And also thanks very much for inviting me to come. It's a great honor. Uh, not just to get to speak in general, but to be among these heroes of mine. And we, we're being really gushy, aren't we? <laughs> we just love each other. It's really cool to be able to speak in the same um, platform. And also I'm looking at the chat. There's a lot of uh, great minds in, in the uh, audience as well. So it's going to be a really good Q&A. So thank you very much. I'm going to try to um, be a little bit more upbeat. I, I was I was promoting his... Um, Christopher's talk, I said he's one of the best speakers, he's so funny, and then we <laughs> went into crush film, so I'm going to try to so U-turn it here, um, and let me go ahead and share my screen, uh, here we go, and I also use this as an opportunity, quite shamelessly, to cram as many rainbows and pink as I could, just because I can, so hopefully... <laughs> Put a smile on your face after that um, last presentation. Very good and critical window. Cool. All right. So I guess um, my claim to fame and why I'm here today is um, Marcin heard me speak at a previous um, talk and I was mentioning some of the um, intersections between tactics with the gay rights movement and the animal rights movement. And my claim to fame here is that I am a trained social movement scholar so I have a, a, a lot of background in different tactics and strategies, motivations, rationales, structures, systems, um, and what motivates, basically what motivates a social movement, how it's successful, how it might not be successful. And it's in exceedingly difficult to measure the success of a movement, especially social movements that have been going on for many decades, but there is a science to it. And for those of you who are not from academia, I think it's one of my life goals is to kind of bring this the science of social movements to activists on the ground because the work that we're doing based on the presentation we just heard like the work that we're doing is so important because there is so much violence and oppression in the world and it really behooves us to actually figure out how can we effectively and strategically combat this structural violence so in this presentation with lots of rainbows and happy animals i'm going to cover some of the ways that the gay rights movement can actually uh, speak to the animal rights movement, what are some lessons that we can learn? 
Yeah, so there's definitely some similarities and Christopher's covered a few of these, so I don't have to go into too much detail, but I will flag some of them. Um, there's, for, for instance, one of the things here, that's why I titled it, you know, Love is Love. It's about compassion for other sentient beings, whether it be human beings or different species. It's about embracing the sameness. We're, diff we're the same animals, but we're same as animals, but we're also different in so many different you know, aspects of our species or race or gender, whatever else. So in those ways, these movements certainly align. And I'm also gonna take it to a critical route, right? So I'm gonna also bring in the sociology here. And a lot of, I think a lot of social movement work, what we do is we get very focused on, very honed in on the tactics, which tactics work, which don't. But as a sociologist, I would encourage us to look at the big picture, what's going on in the economy, the political atmosphere, what's going on in the culture. These sorts of things can uh, determine the efficacy of certain tactics. So certainly the animal rights movement, we're seeing a turn now towards social psychology where uh, like colleagues here at the University of Kent will run statistics and say, all right, this is this tag, this brochure is more effective, or this wording is more effective to persuade people. But that's too micro level in a lot of ways. So I'm going to present some more macro level structural analysis as analyses that I think will be useful for folks, regardless, actually, regardless if you're interested in the animal rights movement, the gay rights movement, or any other movement, these are processes that we're seeing happening uh, across really all the left movements. So it should be interesting. Uh, one of the big uh, concerns here is the role of the marketplace. So it's a marketplace of somewhere where we can actually find social justice or is a marketplace sort of a sand trap? <laughs> like the more we dig in it, the more we're gonna get trapped and it's not actually gonna liberate anyone. So these are some things we can think about. Okay, so again, I think that there's a lot of overlap between these two movements. Um, first off, they're, we're both, it's both, they're both left, leftist social justice movements, but fundamentally the gay rights movement and the animal rights movement is about love and compassion. Right at the heart of it, it's about concern for others, empathy for others. It's about fundamentally, it's about love. And as uh, Christopher mentioned, and Sir Amelia is also going to discuss, it's also a really radical recognition that it's not just about heterosexual relationships or even uh, mother, father, or sorry, mother, father, and children relationships. There's all kinds of different meaningful familial relationships. You know, I'm a single woman and I live with a dog and a cat and those relationships are very, very important to me. When my dogs die or my cats die, like I would grieve like I would if any other family member died. And the animal rights movement, one of the goals that it has is to actually legitimize those types of relationships, recognize non-human animals as persons in their own right. So certainly another place that there's overlap is we're looking at rights, justice, equality, right? These are kind of uh, the go-to ones. And then ultimately also, the celebration of diversity. So this kind of a, a balancing act here where we want to embrace the sameness. So we're all animals, right? And we're all humans or we're all animals, whichever movement we're looking at, but also we recognize and celebrate that we're all different in all these wonderful ways, right? It's not about cramming everybody together, but recognizing that difference and celebrating that difference. So we see that with both, with both movements for sure. There's me and Mishka, is Mishka being good? Okay, she's down behind me sleeping now. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there's quite a few uh, shared experiences. Again, we got a, a few pretty graphic examples in, in the past um, presentation. But one of the more fundamental things that we see similarly with these two movements is with non-human animals, their, their sexuality will often be policed. So as Christopher was mentioning in the farming system, that sexuality is definitely, definitely um, policed and heterosexuality is absolutely mandated in a lot of ways. And by the way, there's a lot of violence that happens to animals who, who uh, stray from that. Uh, we also, there's some sociological research where we found that non-human animals are used to teach gender. So what is appropriate mommy behavior? What's appropriate daddy behavior? We'd like, for instance, there's a, a student who went to a zoo and did participant observation and parents would, would teach their children about traditional family roles by saying, oh, look at the mommy line and what the daddy line are doing. So non-human animals become proxies as a way to kind of uh, normalize particular heterosexual relationships even within humans. I mentioned that there's violence against animals who are not heterosexual, but there's also violence against animals who are intersex. Um, like my little dog, Mishka, Mishka, I say she, but Mishka's actually intersex. And I adopted her specifically because she was, and I was, it was the woman who was doing the adoption says, I'm gonna have difficulty adopting this dog. I said, give me that dog. 
But Mishka is just a, you know, a mutt from Bulgaria, but you can imagine for lots of purebred dogs that if the dog comes out intersex, that's a deformity and that dog would be liable to uh, destruction. My dog also happens to be deaf and deaf dogs are also very vulnerable to, to violence as well. Um, in the farming industry, if you have animals who are born intersex, they're pretty much immediately destroyed because they can't reproduce. And if, if for instance, with uh, dairy cows, if you have cows that can't produce, reproduce, then they're not going to be profitable. So there's a lot of violence within the food system uh, as well, not just companion animals. And then we also want to think about the animalization of folks, uh, of queer folks. And this animalization is something that we see across the board. Anytime it's a, a marginalized human group, you can guarantee that there's animalization at work because basically the baseline of, of animalization towards non-human animals becomes sort of roadmap. How can we oppress other marginalized groups? So this is kind of the heart of that intersectional theory. As long as we say it's okay to marginalize and oppress one group, that framework is always gonna be present to do it to other marginalized groups. So certainly we saw in the last presentation, some of the ways that uh, the gay people have been uh, demonstrated to be deviant, animal-like in certain ways. And so animalization is, uh, is something we wanna keep in mind as well. Now, looking at barriers, there's certainly a lot of uh, shared space, shared barriers as well. Uh, one of the first ones would be just outright disgust. There's, that's the whole term uh, hom homophobia, which I don't really like that word homophobia because it uses the word phobia as though, you know, it's kind of like an ableist bit to it. I don't really like that. And sometimes it's not really about disgust. It's just straight up bigotry in a lot of ways where it's structural discrimination. But certainly there is an element of disgust, uh, disgust when it comes to that. So we see that with non-human animals as well. Uh, not all species, but certainly a lot of species like with um rats or mice or possums or raccoons, people might feel dis that that's disgusting, insects, things like that, Other, uh, otherization. So these are processes that happen with, with queer folks and with non-human animals. The conservative ideas about family and relationships, which I just mentioned and also Christopher has talked about, so I'll go on from that one. Laws that are restricting. So certainly with, Certainly with gay folks, we've had many, many laws on the books that's outlawed gay sex or outlawed gay marriage. Uh, but certainly there's laws on the books that have normalized all kinds of terrible stuff for non-human animals. So the, the legal sphere has been very important for both movements as well. There's also an issue of public ignorance and people who just don't know anything about gay people or don't know anything about other animals. Uh, one of the problems with modernity is that it has segregated non-human animals to where a lot of people don't have an everyday interaction with other animals. And so with that segregation, it's very easy then to fall back on stereotypes and to normalize a lot of structural violence. So public ignorance for both. And because of that ignorance, one of the most important strategies then is coming out of the closet. So here's Trudy, Miss Trudy, bless her heart. She's no longer with us. When I first adopted her, uh, this is more discrimination. I adopted her because she was a black cat. And they, I went into the shelter and I said, give me the cat nobody wants. I can't pick. And they said the black cat because no one wants the black animals. So that's a whole thing we can unpack. But she, when I first adopted her, she wouldn't come out of the closet for two or three days. She was shy. She's shy the whole time I had her. Uh, anyway, but coming out of the closet has been a very, very important strategy for the gay rights movement because it helped to break down that ignorance. So now straight people who say, who didn't know anything about gay people suddenly realize, oh, I do know gay people and wow, they're just regular people. And so coming out of the closet was a very important strategy for that. Now, increasingly we're starting to see that with the vegan movement as well and the animal rights movement, instead of kind of hiding your veganism and uh, people in the chat, you can kind of share your experiences, but I've, I've been vegan for over 20 years. And I remember many times in my past where it was just like so much easier to just say I have a food allergy just to get on with it or just not talk, just not eat or something so I didn't have to deal with it. But nowadays you just, it's much easier to say, oh, I'm vegan and it's not, ugh, you know, because we're now becoming more proud about being vegan and that helps to break down the ignorance about it. And I, even the simple stuff, like when I first went vegan, people wouldn't even know how to pronounce vegan. <laughs> so coming out of the closet, so to speak, is a very important way of breaking down that ignorance uh, and making people more comfortable with it. And it's also confronting the stigma. So stigma has been very, very powerful means not of, of, of not just putting a group down or social movement down, but also those people start to internalize it. It's a very cruel thing in a lot of ways. So the gay rights movement has been really transformational in that way and saying, you know what, screw your stigma. We're gonna turn it into pride. 
And so we're gonna talk about the, the pride marches here in a minute. So increasing visibility was one of the ways to do that. So being open about your identity, doing the marches and the animal rights movement has been doing this as well, right? Boycotts, boycotts is another thing that the gay rights movement and the animal rights movement do. The animal rights movement, because it's adopted veganism and vegetarianism by its very nature is all about boycotts. But I think maybe people who are coming from the vegan um, flanks in the, in the talk today might not be aware of some of the stuff that the gay rights movement have done. So I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit about the efficacy potential of boycotts. And then of course, because of all the laws that have been put into place to, um, to have been really problematic for gay folks and for non-human animals, certainly there's a lot of uh, advocacy that's been happening in the legal sphere as well. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of interesting books out there, by the way, if you're interested in learning more about the strategies behind social movements and the gay rights movement, because of all the recent victories, there's um, some books that have been coming out. I just happened to be living in Ireland at the time when Ireland legalized gay marriage. And then I went on to do a, a social movement class on Irish social movements. So <laughs> I've just bizarrely have all, read a lot on specifically the Irish gay rights movement. Um, but they have a book, if you're interested in this, that the people who organized to get this on the um, ballot and get people vote, they've written a book about all the strategies and how they collaborated to get this done. And I didn't put the picture up here, but you can easily, it's called Yes. I think it's called Yes. Um, so basically in that book, they talk about what they did and they were based, they're pretty much saying we have to be about positivity. It's about positive messages that everybody can get on board with. And it was really, really fascinating actually to walk around the streets because I was living in Cork at the time, just to walk around the streets and you could see the posters and how they put the images they chose, the words they, uh, they used, the framing they used. It was all about that positivity because everybody feels like can be on board with this. And if you use that language, like the title of this talk, like love is love, like who's against love? Love is awesome. Rainbows are awesome. Happiness is awesome. Like all this kind of like energetic stuff that gets people on board. The animal rights movement, not always consistent <laughs> with that approach. Sometimes they'll, you'll have the folks who are like, all right, we always want to be positive and put on a smile, but then we're just blasting the public with graphic images, which is not at all the same. <laughs> it's a totally different kind of um, atmosphere you're creating. I know the Vegan Society has just launched a new normal campaign where they're trying to tap into that sort of uh, framework, I guess, where it's about, it's normal to care about animals and we all love animals. And so tapping into that, that compassion that we already have and so that I think is a really important place where the animal rights movement could learn from the gay rights movement. Can you imagine that the gay rights movement, their main thing was let's just like blast the public with movies and commercials and billboards of all these horrible things happening to gay people. Like it would jar people, but would it create that cohesiveness? I don't know, I'm not quite sure. So it was really strategic that they went with this kind of positive vibe. And in the case of Ireland as well, they were very clear about being culturally resonant so Ireland is a very unique situation because it's traditionally quite conservative and traditionally quite Catholic, which is why the gay rights were so much more um, stunted there. So the campaigners were very clear. They used the Irish language in their campaigning. They said, this is part of Irish culture. Like Ireland is a post-colonial space, right? And they are actually, Ireland is marking its centennial this year. It's only been a country for a hundred years. So they were able to kind of pull on that sort of liberation type of logic and culture and history in order to say, actually, this is, to, this is Irish, to be free, to be able to love, to have liberty. So what can the animal rights movement learn from that? You might be thinking, if you have ideas, you can share them in the chat. The other thing that the gay rights movement, specifically the one in Ireland, but also I've, this happens in the United States, is this notion of a unified front. I'm gonna come back to this, but a unified front is really pushed by actually a lot of social movements. If we all have to show the public that we are all on the same board and this is what we want. And especially with the Irish push to get um, gay, gay marriage legalized, that was a major, major part of their campaign. Using media very strategically, Again, I'm going back to the Irish example because Ireland's a very small country and again, very conservative. How was it that they were able to become so, I mean, they beat the United States, let's be clear. They legalized gay marriage before even the United States and the United States is certainly very conservative, but Ireland is a Catholic culture where abortion wasn't even legal for a long time. Divorce wasn't, for heterosexual people wasn't even 
uh, allowed until recently. And it's still very difficult to get divorced, by the way, uh, for heteros, I guess for everybody now. So how are they able to overcome those challenges? Me the media was very, very important. So in the book, they outline all the ways that they strategize that. But you can use the media, a very small group of people well-connected can make a big difference by creating um, not just strategic campaigns, but creating a sense of it's bigger than what we are. So the animal rights movement can be thinking about that as well. There's a book that just came out by Robert Garner about the Oxford group in 1970s England with Peter Singer, Robert, um, uh, Richard Ryder and Bridget Brophy and all those folks. That was a small group of people, but they were able to do so much, make such an impact. So being able to strategically access the media is very important. I think that's also uh, room for some optimism. One of the things I'm also, I've also seen with these both, both of these movements, however, is very quickly these movements went from a very grassroots, inclusive type of movement to let's go capitalistic on this. So in this book, this, if there's any book that I can recommend, it's this, oh, I'm telling you, this book has been such a game changer for me in my work. It's called Selling Out. And it's an older book. It's about 20 years old now. But this book chronicles the gay rights movement in the United States. And it's just like chock full of my highlighting in here because I read it several years ago. It's just so good. But in this book, the author makes the case that as the movement kind of entered the late 20th century into this neoliberal sort of era, they went out of the closet and into the bank. And it was all about how can we, how can we grow our organizations to be more profitable? How can we align with advertisers and elites and industries? And basically turning what was a social justice and human rights movement into a consumer movement. And so the vegans in the chat should already be thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> that's pretty much the bread and vegan butter of the animal rights movement, isn't it? So the argument in this book is that marketplaces were never spaces for equality. From the very beginning, and this is in the looking at the United States as a case example, from the very beginning of the marketplace politics in the United States, it was only a place for rich, rich white dudes. It was never a place for everybody to come in. And capitalism in itself, it's a system of inequality. It is a system of inequality. It is not a system of equality. So the fact that social justice advocates are thinking they can turn to capitalism to somehow create equality out of a system that's designed to do the opposite is quite bizarre, right? So this, this, is, this is basically the, the theme of this book and why it's just so genius. So actually these markets are sources of inequality. We should be very critical then when we turn to these, these spaces for support or for breadth or public resonance or whatever you wanna call it, or to create, to get resources and mobilize resources for your movement. What en ends up happening is that consumption becomes a form of identity expression. And this, I saw the sandwich, the sandwich in the back of the PowerPoint, uh, sorry, the slide here. I saw that in a grocery store a couple of years ago during Pride Month. And first off, intersectional failure, right? There's like animal parts all up in this, but I was just thinking, okay, I can demonstrate my queerness by buying this sandwich, or I can celebrate my allyship by buying this sandwich. What the hell does a sandwich have to do with being like with gay justice? It's just, that's like the level of absurdity it gets to. And of course you can think of sure lots of other examples, but what happens here is that capitalism recognizes very quickly that these identity politics can actually be quite profitable, right? Instead of just selling this bland sandwich, we can have all these different types of sandwiches that cater to all these different types of people. And you'll be compelled to buy this because it's an expression of who you are. <laughs> and so social movements can become easily co-opted then by the marketplace. And let us not forget that the media is by and large elite owned. So the gay rights movement historically, and this history is outlined in this book, historically, the media space was much more grassroots, it was much more gay owned. And so the media could actually be a space where cool stuff could happen. We can do a lot of um, mobilization and organization. But then when you start to go into the mainstream media spaces, these are owned by major elite run industries, right? They, they're not about social justice. If social justice is gonna disrupt where they make their money. So instead what they do very cleverly is they figure out how they can make money out of this threat and then strip the threat away. And mainstream media also is very advertiser dependent. 
they're not going to put stuff that's radical in there that's going to disrupt the people who um, who are paying for the advertisements. They're just not going to do it. So you see that with gay rights movement, and you definitely see that with the vegan movement. For instance, let's just I just finished a content analysis of UK newspapers for the year 2020, so not that long ago. It was a replication study of a, uh, one that was done by Matthew Cole and Karen Morgan in 2011. And when they did their study back in 2011, it was actually based on a 2007 sample. Vegan only came up in the UK British newspapers about 400 times or something. When I replicated it uh, for 2020, vegan came up 45,000 times. 45,000 times. So I had to do a sample. And I did the sample. And only one out of 400 plus articles that I coded had anything to do did, with animal rights. Everything else had to do with this new vegan product that you can purchase. So what does that mean then for social justice when animal rights are completely devoid? You can't go to the marketplace to think you're going to find social justice. You go to the marketplace you're going to find more crap to buy, in other words. Same deal with the marches. The marches became big business. So if, again, they're very important for you know breaking down stigma, breaking down ignorance, showing that people exist, that these movements exist, normalizing these events. But unfortunately, they're also um, corporate nightmares in a lot of ways. The Animal Rights March, the first Animal Rights March, which happened, I think, in 1990, like something like 30,000 people showed up in Washington, D.C., Tom Reagan reckons it was even more. It was something like 70 or 80,000, something like that. But then the second time around, when they wanted to reconvene in the mid-1990s, by then, uh, different the, lots of charities that were involved that were now big nonprofits, and they wanted to kind of compromise their messaging. And there was infighting about different um, perspectives and, and how there was compromising happening, blah, blah, blah. Only a few, it's like two or 3,000 people showed up to the second march. So an immediate, like, because of this kind of corporate infiltration. The gay rights movement, on the other hand, has only exploded from all of this. When I went to my first gay pride march, or not even a march, it's extravaganza, it was in San Francisco, and it was so many people. It was just like, if anybody's been to that, it's like a whole, it's one of the wildest things I've ever been to. So that is awesome. It's awesome because this is a great cultural thing. But on the other hand, it was just stuff for sale, stuff for sale. And so this has become a major point of factionalism for the gay rights movement, for the animal rights movement, for lots of movements. Radical messages necessarily get tampered down. It's all about what can we sell? How can we put on this smiling face that make not just for the public, but for our advertisers? <clears throat> This brings me to boycotts, and I'm almost finished now for the sake of time. I'm almost finished. This brings us to boycotts. So boycotts are a very, very popular thing in the animal rights movement. As I said, it's sort of our vegan bread and bread and vegan butter. Uh, just going vegan itself is a type of boycott, isn't it? Um, but the idea here is that we vote with our dollar. But the argument is made by, in this beautiful book, Selling Out, and uh, other sociology books can contribute to that argument as well. The argument here is that if you think you can vote with your dollar and you can pay for this better, this better product or whatever it may be, you, it's this fantasy of ethical capital, capitalism. But again, the capitalist system itself is built on injustice and exploitation. If you change it to make it just and non-exploitative, you don't have capitalism anymore. You have something else. So this, the boycotts, unfortunately, still perpetuate and normalize a capitalist system. So why do I have orange juice here? Um, orange juice is awesome, but this is one of the very first gay rights boycotts in the U.S. Um, I think it was back in the 70s, but there was this campaign where they were so it was Florida orange juice. And if you bought this orange juice, the profits from it were being funneled into this campaign to um, remove this law to it's basically a protection for for gay folks. And this is like the 1970s. So any protection was all you had we were precious so it became this big outcry across the whole gay movement you had gay bars that refused to serve florida orange juice you had uh, harvey milk was involved with it and ultimately the boycott i mean it spread people weren't buying that orange juice but ultimately the boycott did not work because that uh law that the orange juice campaign was trying to get rid of actually they got rid of it and so it failed uh but boycotts continue and we can also see this with the vegan movement as well, where we have this vegan movement that has been thriving and thriving, and yet meat 
and dairy production continues to increase globally. And also we have the horrific bit of greenwashing and humane washing, where this idea that if I, if I boycott this product and support this product or pay a little bit more for this product, then it's okay. This is ethical capitalism right here. I'm paying for this morality with a little bit of extra money or by choosing this product and not that product. So we're once again, conflating political action with consumption. And that's inherently problematic when we have a system that is designed to exploit the capitalist system. So wrapping up then, what we need to start doing then is think about, yeah, obviously when we're looking at the animal rights movement, there's gonna be individual consumption involved. There just has to be. Um, just because veganism is not so easy to tap topple speciesism doesn't mean I'm going to start eating a hamburger like oh it doesn't matter I guess I'll just eat a hamburger now obviously my individual consumption is still important but we also need to be thinking about how can we work collectively and mobilize collectively especially now in the 21st century when a lot of our work is taking place behind computer screens and we're by ourselves a lot of the time we need to get back to that kind of ethic from the 1970s early 1980s where we're actually working collectively and we don't just reduce our activism to uh, buying a membership to PETA or buying a vegan sandwich or whatever. It has to be something more than that. We also have to be thinking structurally. And that means challenging the capitalist system itself. The capitalist system itself cannot stand if we want to dismantle speciesism or heterosexism or sexism or any other ism. Capitalism is at the root a lot of a lot of that oppression. How can we do that? Of course, that's very daunting. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but one of the things that we can do is start challenging the government not to subsidize animal farming for one and to start subsidizing just transition to more sustainable farming practices. That's just one example. We also wanna be thinking again, challenging that consumerism as activism. Are we really advocating for the right for respect and justice and equality? Or are we just advocating for the right to consume? And so I know in a lot of vegan spaces, and I'm guilty as charged, like on Instagram, I follow a lot of these vegan groups when it's like nothing to do at all with animal rights. It's just like, all right, here's the new vegan sandwich that's for sale at such and such restaurant. And like, Ooh, get really excited. It, but it's not a it's not a rights movement for me and how much choice I have at the grocery store. This is a movement for other animals and challenging speciesism. So we need to make sure we keep that in check. And the last bit we haven't really talked about but there's certainly issues with privilege and leadership. We have privilege, privilege and representation. That has to be challenged. We start, need to start integrating intersectional practice into our nonprofits as well and into our grassroots collaborations. So we need to be challenging intersectional failures as they happen within our own movement. And we have to start looking outward and building intersections with other movements as well. Like today's uh, presentation, like what we're doing tonight, this is amazing. This is a good first step in that in that journey. So I'm shutting up now. And if you want to learn more about the stuff that I do, there's my last rainbow. Uh, you can go to my website. All of my research is there absolutely free, except my books. But if you can't afford my books, just shoot me an email. Um, you can go to veganfeministnetwork.com. I've got lots of essays there from not just for myself, but lots of other women and non-binary folks, trans folks. Uh, vegansociology.com is also a really good resource and then check me out on social media if you're not sick of me already so i will shut up now <laughs> thanks everybody i hope it wasn't too long thank you so much Corey. so much food for thought and and i hope we get to discuss some of these issues just in a moment so uh for now without further ado let's uh move on to our last presentation by uh emilia and let me just briefly introduce uh, Emilia Quinn, who joined the University of Amsterdam in 2019 as a lecturer in English and was appointed as Assistant Professor of World Literatures and Environmental Humanities in 2021. Prior to that, Emilia received her PhD from the University of Oxford. Um, now at the University of Amsterdam, among other things, she coordinates the uh, courses on literature, empire, and the post-colonial world, and contemporary world literature, as well as um, contemporary world literature objects, problems, forms. Emilia's research establishes the emergent uh, field of vegan theory and its intersections with animal studies, queer theory, eco-criticism, and post-colonial studies. 
Her recent monograph, Reading Veganism, The Monstrous Vegan, 1818 to Present, published by Oxford University Press in 2021, establishes a trajectory of literary vegan veganisms across two centuries of Anglophone literature, identifying the repetition of the trope of the monstrous vegan. Uh, Emilia's ongoing work turns to the relationship between ethics and aesthetics. Um, Emilia, over to you, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'll just uh, share my screen so that should be clear, right? Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super thrilled to be here. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to think uh, briefly about the intersections between, uh, as you said, the kind of emergent field of vegan theory and ongoing work in contemporary query contemporary queer theory, sorry, uh, by providing a brief introduction to my own work in this area. So focusing specifically on my recent book on vegan monsters and the theorization I offer there of a vegan camp aesthetics. So these outlines are gonna be necessarily very surface glosses, but I hope gives enough of an overview to lead to, to further discussion. Uh, so I'll begin with a brief gloss on my understanding of veganism itself and how we define it in order to contextualize the theoretical focus of my work. So one of the first things that we possibly need to do is to distinguish what vegan theory or vegan literary analysis is in distinction from vegetarian analysis. Uh, and so the vegetarian society itself offers the following definition of vegetarianism. In the interest of time, I won't read it, but what's worth noting for my purposes here is that this definition is one that is really only about what one puts in one's mouth. Uh, so the focus on, on non-ingestion uh, provides here a pretty clear demarcation of the vegetarian as a recognizable and achievable and a stable identity. So within the terms of this definition, if you don't eat meat, you are a vegetarian. So by contrast, the vegan society offers the following definition. So a philosophy and way of living, which seeks to exclude as far as is possible and practicable, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. And by extension promotes the development and use of animal free alternatives for the benefit of humans, animals, and the environment. In dietary terms, it denotes the practice of dispensing with all products derived wholly or partly from animals. So while the ethical limits of veganism appear here with certainty, it's about all forms and all products of exploitation. What's interesting is that the definition frames veganism within the hyphenated clause as far as is possible and practicable. So while striving towards the end of all forms of exploitation, veganism at the level of this official definition appears tethered to the burdens of its impossibly inclusive aspirations. So reliant on a recognition of that which is neither possible nor practicable. So the vegan society's definition captures the inevitability of veganism's only partially realized ideal, inferring both an absence of viable alternatives and infrastructures and the inevitability of exploitative relations. And so, of course, I think most of us will acknowledge that if one wanted to be 100% vegan, one would really have to absent oneself from the world altogether. If we look at secondary and tertiary levels of exploitation, we would risk descending into an endless abyss of abstention. Possessing a body that must inevitably ingest, trample or uproot animals through everyday actions or displace and endanger them through participation in global capitalism suggests an ethical impasse that must be continually addressed. And so it's this sense of impossibility, insufficiency and failure that for me is the most important distinction to be drawn between veganism and vegetarianism. Veganism is certainly much more than what we put in our mouths and does not, despite what many mainstream stereotypes might suggest, provide any easy, stable or fixed answer to the problems of modern living. So I see it as a utopian striving towards a better world, but one that must grapple daily with those impossibilities. So not a state of moral righteousness. I argue that identification as a vegan is explicitly haunted by an implicit guilt or bad conscience. Veganism is defined by finding oneself always unable to meet the all-inclusive scope of its ethical aspirations. So ultimately I argue that veganism might best be conceptualized as a state of strategic insufficiency in which a sense of failure and complicity coexists with utopian gestures and ethical commitments. So as is perhaps 
clear for those who are working in queer theory, it's this definition of veganism as a state of strategic insufficiency that draws me uh, towards queer theory, uh, and particularly some of the theorists here. Um, so I think Corey's done a great job of, of showing the ways in which these movements align, but I think there may still be some hesitation about the perhaps problematic conflation that can happen with queerness and veganism, that with at risk of conflating two very distinct notions of identity and histories of oppression. Um, but as the influential work of people like Carol J. Adams and Jeff Derrida have noted, heterosexual masculinity and human subjectivity itself have long relied on the assumption of a compulsory carnivorism. Um, so in a prior uh, collection that I edited with Benjamin Westwood, we asserted four key points of connection between veganism and queerness that I thought I'd just um, quote here. So first, veganism challenges many of the same objects of critique found in queer theory, especially normative gendered and sexual identities. Second, veganism expands the scope of queer ideas of alternative affiliation to include relations with non-human animals. Third, vegan structure resembles the use of queer as an umbrella term for a diversity of subject positions, which nonetheless rejects the stultifying logic of identity politics. Finally, in its interest in maligned ideas of utopianism and failure, recent queer theory has engaged directly with issues that undergo a productive rethinking through veganism. So to elaborate on this latter point, uh, Jose Munoz's work in particular, uh, as advanced in cruising utopia, argues of the queer utopian potentialities that are embedded within the present. So for Munoz to quote, queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. So he seeks therefore instances within the present, even if an oppressive and untenable present that burn with what he terms utopian potentialities, the possibility of a different, better state that is already there rather than something just promised into the future. Um, so I argue that both queer theory and vegan theory are seeking to balance negativity with utopianism and that we might theorize vegan actions as this kind of inaction of utopian possibilities in the present. So that is the, I guess, broad shape of the theoretical sense of veganism that I want to put across. And I'll turn now to, to my recent book, um, as Martin uh, mentioned, which came out with OUP in November. Um, so in this book, I developed my interest in the intersections between veganism and queer theory and seek to establish what it means to take a vegan theoretical approach to the study of literature. So to do this, I offer a series of re-readings of canonical texts, explicating their overlooked potential as sources for thinking about vegan modes of life. So considering novels from the Romantic period through to the contemporary, the book works to identify a distinct literary trope of what I call the monstrous vegan, a figure that is seen to bring to the fore the intersections I've just been talking about of this sense of failure and utopianism. So tracking this figure across these kind of two centuries of Anglophone literature, reading veganism explores the origins and mutations of vegan monstrosity across a range of national and historical contexts from Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein through to the present. Um, so as I said, these monsters are seen to embody a kind of grappling with difficulty and failure that I posit as at the heart of a vegan state of being. And I define the monstrous vegan in relation to the four key tropes. So these kind of um, aspects that appear again and again and seem to kind of crystallize into this clear literary myth. So first, monstrous vegans do not eat animals, an abstinence that generates a seemingly inexplicable anxiety in those who encounter them. Second, they are hybrid assemblages of human and non-human animal parts, destabilizing species boundaries. Third, monstrous vegans are sired outside of heterosexual reproduction, the product of male acts of creation. And finally, monstrous vegans are intimately connected to acts of writing and literary creation. So these traits see monstrous vegan literary figures draw attention to the anxieties and tensions generated by attempts to inscribe a pre-existing discursive vegan code onto the corporeal body, and therefore to broader questions of what it means to read and write veganism. 
So the book is divided into, into two parts that you can see here. Uh, and part one is, is tracing the origins and mutations of vegan monstrosity in a clear historical trajectory. Uh, so I begin uh, with Frankenstein, which many of you will be familiar with uh, from Carol Adams's work, uh, thinking about the novel's treatment of a creature whose explicit rejection of meat eating and desire to return to an Edenic vision of vegetarianism ties the book into 19th century ideas about the vegetarian origins of man. I then turn to the work of H.G. Wells, so late 19th century science fiction texts. So in his 1896, The Island of Dr. Moreau, for example, he explicitly rewrites the myth of Frankenstein, but rather than as a vegetarianism being an original state of mankind, it appears as a deeply patriarchal and disciplinary discourse. So the half human, half animal hybrid beast people must continually repeat the dictate not to eat flesh or fish in order to keep their seemingly innate carnivorous desires at bay. Uh, and then at the end of this historical trajectory, I turn to Margaret At Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy published between 2003 and 2013. Uh, and in the speculative fiction series, she explicitly rewrites the vegan monsters of both Shelley and Wells ultimately to satirize veganism as an insincere projection of innocence that fails to acknowledge the inevitability of our implication in the killing and eating of others. So there's seemingly very little redemption offered by this narrative trajectory um, without with sense of veganism kind of giving us uh, very little other than uh, a bleak portrait. So in part two, I seek to understand what we might gain from embracing the monstrous vegan. Uh, and I turn to two contemporary iterations of the monstrous vegan trope. So the ways in which both Katia and Alan Hollinghurst are seen to engage with the trope of the monstrous vegan gestures towards the possibility of rehabilitating monstrous veganism, of performing a monstrous veganism, or enacting it as a mode of camp excess. And I conclude, therefore, with the proposal that if veganism and its manifestation in the monstrous vegan exists as a literary and discursive trope inscribed onto bodies, they can also be consciously inhabited as an excessive and parodic performance. So exploring monstrous vegans is important in several ways. First, it helps to unravel what exactly it is about veganism that makes it such a persistent locus of fear and anxiety. Second, vegan monsters rehearse the key paradoxes involved in the writing of vegan identity. The analysis of monstrous vegan figures offers a way of reconceptualizing veganism in the present moment, a way of thinking through the complex coming together of utopianism and insufficiency that I've argued in here in vegan modes of life. I argued that in order for veganism to maintain its efficacy as a mode of engagement with and response to the non-human world, it must remain fragmentary and hybrid, akin to the monstrous vegan creations I examine. And third, if monstrous functions as an injurious term, I argue that the monstrous vegan nonetheless confers a productive social identity upon individual vegans. It's a figure who allows for complexity, inconsistency, and insufficiency to coexist alongside a queer and utopian investment in what it might mean to understand one's sense of being human otherwise. So this embrace of the monstrous vegan in part two of the book ties into my ongoing interest into what exactly a reparative mode of vegan aesthetics might look like. And I read Hollinghurst novels, for instance, through the lens of vegan camp. And this perhaps I think speaks to the tension that, that Corey identified when she started of the, the kind of horror of, of Christopher's images and, and the fun she's aiming for in her presentation. Um, so in my article, um, Notes on Vegan Camp, that was published in PMLA in 2020, uh, this is really where I first started exploring this idea of, of, of vegan camp and reparative vegan aesthetics. So I wanted to end my talk by briefly glossing this piece uh, and I hope that we can think more in the discussion part, though I'm aware that that part is, <laughs> is shrinking, um, about the extent to which performing one's veganism as monstrous allows us to play with and advance a vegan camp sensibility. So in Notes on Vegan Camp, I seek to challenge and complicate the predominant narrative in vegan-oriented scholarship that focuses on the necessity of making visible and bearing witness to suffering. So this attitude can be 
kind of encapsulated by this quote that is much popularized, in, particularly in animal rights circles, that if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be a vegetarian. So in this logic, visibility and revelation are key to vegetarian and vegan conversions. And while such a strategy is useful and necessary, it can also be read as a form of that which Eve Kosofsky Cedric has called paranoid reading. So to quote Cedric, paranoid reading assumes that the one thing lacking for global revolution, explosion of gender roles or whatever, is peoples, that is other peoples, having the painful effects of their oppression, poverty or deludedness sufficiently exacerbated to make the pain conscious as if otherwise it wouldn't have been and intolerable as if intolerable situations were famous for generating excellent solutions. So ultimately Cedric argues that while paranoid reading can be useful and politically necessary, it is only one way among others of seeking, finding and organizing knowledge. So akin to this distinction that Cedric draws between the paranoid and then the reparative reading practices, Wiegenkamp turns away from a focus on exposing systemic violence and offers a way of accounting for the vegan pleasures and desires that often un intersect in uncomfortable ways um, with, with kind of mass slaughter. Um, but first to think briefly about camp itself, uh, as I'm sure, I guess, as a, as a queer network, most of you are aware, Susan Sontag's 1964 Notes on Camp is one of the most famous attempts to articulate what it is we mean when we talk about camp. So for Sontag, camp is a sensibility that manifests to quote as a love of the unnatural, of artifice and exaggeration. It converts the serious into the frivolous, seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon and reveling in stylization and extravagance. So to quote Sontag again, to perceive camp in objects and persons is to understand being as playing a role. By contrast, the traditional remit of vegan aesthetic critique is to recover that which Carol J. Adams refers to as the absent referent animal that is made absence through its kind of slaughter, dismemberment, death, and as through metaphor or naming practices. So in Sontag's descriptions of camp, she describes as an archetypal example, the idea of a woman walking around in a dress made of three million feathers. If we were to employ uh, Adams's lens to this example, we would be required to focus our attention on the dead birds that would have been plucked to make such dress. But to do so would be to contradict that which Sontag sees as the essence of camp, a disengaged refusal to see content beyond surface, expressive of a love of things being what they are not. So rather than therefore seeing camp as antithetical to an ethical vegan aesthetics, I argue that we might interrogate the centrality of the overdetermined significations of dead animal bodies to much queer camp. Certainly the prom prominence of things like fake fur, PVC, plastic feather boas within me many queer camp performances already gestures towards its engagement with the artifice of the binary division between the human and non-human animal. And the reproduction of such products of exploitation in kitsch plastic substitutes destabilizes their seemingly fixed referential value as markers of gender, class, or race. So vegan camp can be defined as an aesthetic lens and sensibility that, while acknowledging the extremity of animal suffering, seeks to draw sustenance from that which has previously only caused pain. And in drawing pleasure from a state of mass violence, vegan camp provides sustenance for individual vegans, for activists, uh, while also refusing what I see as a damaging sense of seeing the veganism, vegan as a, as a morally righteous, beautiful soul. Because with the camp enjoyment comes an acknowledgement of a seemingly in inevitable individual complicity in global capitalist structures that support animal exploitation. Laughing in the face of horror can here be seen as a performance of one's own complicity, whereby complicity affords a temporary mode of ethical affiliation a way of occupying the present that acknowledges rather than castigates feelings of failure and insufficiency. So in order to, I guess, just kind of demonstrate what I mean, I just have some examples of what I would consider to be uh, vegan camp objects, or at least objects we can read through a vegan camp lens. So we have some uh, bad taxidermy uh, as examples of kind of attempts to understand the animal and uh, take control of the natural world that have gone quite wrong. Um, and some more there. 
apologies, my wife is chuckling in the background. Um, then you have Lady Gaga's kind of iconic meat dress that she wore to the 2010 uh, video MTV Music Awards, uh, and which was then recreated in this uh, Barbie hot pot in a Cantonese restaurant in New York. Um, and we might also think as a further example of that quote that Christopher showed about the man who's kind of shutting his eyes and wishing his wife was a horse, that that in itself seems to be something that we might enjoy as a, as a kind of camp statement about human desires to be close to, to understand, or to, to be in relation to animals. Um, because with each of these examples, you know, particularly the, these, these meteor ones, we, we perhaps are encouraged to recognize and remember the real dead animals that were slaughtered and disemboweled to make them. Uh, that's what kind of Adams's work would encourage us to do. But Vegan Camp acknowledges that our aesthetic and affective responses don't always exactly align with our ethical uh, stance, right? I don't immediately want to dismiss these examples as kind of uh, symbols of exploitation, as relics of atrocity, uh, because I do find them pretty funny and that they refuse the seriousness or sincerity that we might otherwise want to use to approach dead animal bodies. Uh, so in the case of, of Gaga, um, that she wasn't choosing to make a conscious vegan statement is not really what matters here. Uh, she enacts a very campy performance that I, I go into in the article in the dress, and we can read that as a parody and destabilization of ideas about heteronormative male desires for both meat and women, right? The meat dress exposes the paradox of misogyny that women are both highly desirable and simultaneously disgusting, uh, right? This dress began to rot over the course of the night. And at the same time, the dress parodies the association between meat and masculinity by emphasizing meat's, you know, meat again, simultaneously desirable and putrid nature. So I define this way of, of, of responding to these objects as a mode of vegan camp, a mode of looking that enjoys these images for their surface performance of human exceptionalism, viewing them as satires on human attempts to know and define the animal or to try and attach human meanings to the surface of meat. And then I'll end with some more, I guess, vegan uh, examples of vegan camp in that they're not made of dead animal bodies, but you have here mock duck uh, that is popularly made like this, particularly in, in Asian supermarkets in which you can see that the duck has been mock plucked. Uh, and then a, a US example of a kind of vegan whole turkey. Um, so mock meat and I guess plant-based dairy products uh, more broadly reduce animal products to their surface aesthetics. Uh, and they offer in the process a specific instance of vegan community building, providing foods that belong to vegans of which vegans share the joke about their own complex relationship to mass culture and normative dietary habits. So while at risk of conforming to narratives that promote the desirability and necessity of consuming animal products, Mock meats also, when viewed through a vegan camp lens, posit that meat as the main constituent of meals, a primary source of protein and strength, and an emblem of masculine virility is merely prosthetic. Um, and I wanted to say, I guess, just very briefly something about obviously the, the distinction between classic camp as a reclamation and survival strategy of gay men for gay men and camp as a performance of a kind of stigmatized vegan self that perhaps is at risk of just ignoring non-human animals altogether. Uh, and it's worth acknowledging that vegan camp is resolutely invested in the human and in vegan identity politics in ways that risk ignoring the animals that veganism ostensibly seeks to protect. Um, but I would argue that such a focus on the vegan over the animal is perhaps a necessary way of avoiding the symbolic consumption of the non-human uh, and of doing something with, with distance rather than always aiming for proximity. Uh, and to go back to queer theory, Tim Dean has argued in relation to queer subcultures that we might need an alternative mode of ethics based on impersonality. So to quote Dean, in which one cares about others even when one cannot see anything of oneself in them. So in the ironic detachment of vegan camp, we can witness the absurdity of human speciesism and a resistance to you know, take control of and possess and, and speak for the animal. Um, so to end, it does, I think, emerge or well, remain to be seen whether a distinct vegan camp scene, a subcultural scene or drag scene is going to emerge. In my own experience, disgust, horror 
and emotional trauma are really more characteristic of, of my responses to literal and symbolic violence against animals than the playfulness I'm trying to suggest here. And often such responses are difficult, if not impossible to overcome. But following Cedric, I suggest that implicit to a vegan confrontation with traumatic violence is a motive of pleasure and the desire for survival in a culture that sustains neither ethical vegans nor the animals to whom our concern extends. So vegan camp might therefore be seen as an aspirational gesture that looks to a future in which products of exploitation will no longer have the power to wound. So I'll end there, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emilia, and, and thank you, everyone. And I, I just must say that I'm struck by the, by the fascinating intersections between these different talks, right? Like uh, between the, 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 the Christopher's and, and, and Corey's talk about, um, about situating veg veganism within those um, anti-American values or social, left social justice movements. So there's a set uh, a set um, within which veganism is situated. And, and then between um, um, Coris and Emilia's uh, talk, uh, different vegan engagements with capitalism, complicity or, or camp, right? And, and a few other topics, and, and I would have so many questions. I will um, leave the floor to uh, those who would like to ask a question right now. We have just under 20 minutes, which I realize is not a lot, but but uh, perhaps if we manage to, to ask brief questions and, and give brief answers as possible, we can still have a discussion.